So, hi, uh, I'm Evan. I'm a character artist and illustrator, and uh, I work mostly in fantasy. Um, but mostly I do character art. Um, uh, and I really enjoy the aspect of character design that goes into um, building a world around a collection of characters. So what I'm going to be talking about today is the importance of having an awareness and an understanding of the world in which your characters live and when you design your characters, uh, taking that world into account and designing from a mindset that works with that world. Um, I think it's important because we create these worlds so that others can go and explore them and have um, in games, for example, interesting adventures and, uh, and look into something that we, we've made. And the more layered we can make that approach and the deeper we can make those worlds, the more worthwhile they are exploring and returning to. Um, so at the beginning of any design process, uh, when you make a world, you are setting up certain expectations. Um, and it is implicit that you will have to solve them um, in terms of being problems. And the more interesting you can make your solutions while respecting the limitations you put on the world you make um, dictates how well people can immerse themselves and, and stay immersed in this world and enjoy it the way you intend for them to do. All of that really comes from understanding. Um, so the more layered your approach is to creating your world, the better your, <coughs> your own under sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, the better your understanding of your own world will be. And you can use that understanding to inform the designs that you make. Um, and you can ask yourself questions um, that lead to better designs, such as what resources are available to the producers of, say, armor or weapons or buildings or whatever in this world. Uh, what technology they have available to them uh, and also what their culture uh, both informs into design, but also how culture is informed by design. Um, and in the end, the, the point here is believability. So the more layered and the... Uh, sorry. <laughs> the deeper your understanding of the world is, uh, the more believable the designs will be. Um, and it's an old sort of um, wording from theater, to will, will the suspension of disbelief. Everyone will give you a certain um, grace period when it comes to immersion. They'll, they'll give your, your world a chance, but if you keep sort of breaking the immersion, they, won't, they will stop believing in your world. So grounding your designs and your, your, your narrative choices in the limitations uh, of the world gives depth to the exploration of that world. And also it pays off to give some thought to the processes by which you, or the things in your world are created. This can also be a great way of informing your design process. Uh, and a lot of the things that tend to uh, inadvertently break the, the immersion is the little things, sort of um, a belt buckle that is the wrong design or shoes with heels, which is a very modern affectation, these sorts of things. So you know, keep an eye out for those. Uh, and also, there is, there's going to be sort of catastrophic limitations to what you can do, for example, in a game. Uh, but you can make those limits work for you. So I just wanted to take the example of Journey, which has one of the greatest ways of dealing with invisible walls ever, which is uh, in the beginning of the game, they do set you up really brilliantly, um, sort of visually guiding you to where they want you to go. But if you're all like me, you go, oh, I'm in a desert. I want to go that way. Uh, and instead of there being just an invisible wall that stops you from going, there are these winds that come and blow you back on track. And it was, I remember when I saw that for the first time, I was expecting uh, an invisible wall. And instead, there was this active part of the world that kept me going back. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to sort of take uh, general principles that I use in, in world building, but specify them for uh, armor, just to sort of keep it a little concentrated. So there are very simple rules that dictate um, the origins and the, the evolution of things like armor. So armor really boils down to protect the things that need protecting, the squiggly bits. So as you see a lot in video games, for example, um, 
that plate armor it tends to be one huge chest plate and some pauldrons and then nothing else, which is really uh, idiosyncratic because what you really want to defend or protect is your stomach because that's where the bowels are. So if, if you get stabbed in the chest, for example, you die fairly quickly. It's not that painful, well, comparatively. But if you get st stabbed in the, in the stomach or in the bowels, um, it's days and days of immense pain. So you really want to limit the, the pain. Um, so you should, uh, when, when you design armors or really anything, take, take into consideration the very base, uh, the, 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 the most basic aspect of what motivates the design. So you see, any proper historical design uh, for armor will sort of run the gamut between what is um, the highest form of protection as, as against to how much you give up in terms of, for example, um, agility or the ability to move, essentially. It's, it's a good example, for example, with the, the guy in the center middle. He has leather armor, but the one place he's actually protecting himself with metal is <laughs> around the belly, protecting the squiggly bits. And you can also tell a lot about a culture and a world's uh, aspect, um, approach to warfare um, by how they dress themselves for the theater of war. The samurai, for example, is um, the warfare of Japan in, in, in the 15th and 16th centuries was as much theater as it was actual fighting. And it's very well reflected in the way they designed, um, especially the, the early um, samurai armors, which look like something out of a, um, a theater. And it had to do with a lot uh, of how they waged war. It was a lot of shouting and a lot of psychological warfare and relatively little hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, the same, for example, with the Polish hussars, who are um, also a very sort of theatrical uh, approach to warfare, where it's um, you try and scare the living shit out of your enemies instead of having to kill them all. Um, but you can tell a lot uh, about a culture and about a people um, from how they design their armors. And uh, a Greek hoplite, for example, from the 300s or 200s before Christ, you can tell, um, as we talked about before, about what uh, resources are available to them. There was bronze, there's leather, uh, linen, and wood, usually copper as well. Um, and a lot of the times when we see depictions of these guys, for example, they're all in, in, in shiny metal armor all over. Um, and not only is that a misrepresentation of what they had available to them, but also what their role on the battlefield was. They weren't these slow-moving tortoises of... of uh, of masses of soldiers that would be later with the Romans, but they would be fairly quick when they needed to, which is why they, they wear relatively light armor uh, and heavy, heavy shields, for example. Um, it also goes into the decoration of, um, of armor, and which feeds back into that whole theater of war thing. You try and look impressive and intimidating as much as being very um, functional. So, since we're designing, or when you're designing for fantasy, you're going to have to deal with other anatomies than humans, and they're going to have other um, things that they need to focus on. So, a, a dwarf's armor will be quite different from an elf's armor, will be quite different from an orc's armor. It's also a question of how you design things and how you think about it. So, a dwarf, for example, will probably be fighting people who are taller than him, so they will probably design an armor around the mantle and around the helmet, because this is where they're going to be hit the most. Uh, an elf would probably design their protective gear around being mobile and being able to move and probably be less of a shielded unit and more of someone who can be very quick. Well, I always like to think that orcs wouldn't design at all. They would just take whatever they find and sort of strap it on um, as best they can. I always, I'm always slightly annoyed when I see very sort of designed orc armor because I never figure... It, it, it's one of the, the hallmark characteristics of orcs that they would be chaotic at best. So I'm going to take just a closer look at dwarves because I'm very fond of them. Um, so one of the, some of the hallmarks of a dwarf is that you know, they're short, they're stocky, um, and they're not, you know, the, they, they don't move very quickly, but they have their advantages and their shortcomings. Uh, but again, so they would, they would probably design their armors quite differently than we humans would. But the problem is you, you often see with how people design dwarf armor is from a human perspective. So they design armor for a tiny person or tiny human rather than for another being all together. 
Uh, you can also see it in the way they would be fighting. They'd probably be fighting upwards, so shorter weapons, um, stabbing weapons, stuff like that. It's probably more sort of anatomically um, useful for a dwarf, but then they're dwarves, they need axes. It's artistic license, it's fine. Um, and this sort of uh, approach goes into every aspect of, of what you design for um, for a culture. It's you know the costumes they wear, the hair, the the way they sort of decorate themselves, the clothing they're building. Um, it's also interesting to see when people see people take on the challenge of creating artificial languages um, and how that can sort of feed in and make or break um, an artificial culture. And when you go into something as complex as trying to um, portray an entire culture, it's important to try and sort of immerse yourself in the mindset of um, these people who are quite different from what we ourselves are. So you have to sort of put your own cultural biases aside and uh, try and understand the core values um, and rules nonetheless of, of the culture that you're going for. Uh, and you can design things around this. You can design rituals and clothing, um, and especially mood. There's, there's something immediately readable when you enter uh, a well-crafted uh, culture, especially in games. Uh, and you can, you can immediately feel it, that there is more here than meets the eye, and there's something worth sort of exploring and going into and learning about. Um, which all boils, boils down to, to nuance, which is, um, which is important because, again, adds another layer of something worthwhile going into. Um, you can go too far down that rabbit hole and sort of make it entirely unapproachable for most people, so it's important to sort of balance that out and keep it somewhat accessible. Um, and I think one of the, one of the uh, instances where I saw, when I saw this like really well done was in the TV series Rome. It is an amazing TV series. So you, if you haven't seen it, you definitely should. If you have, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the costumes are great. They are sort of a fairly um, good representation of what clothing would have been at the time while um, introducing some more modern aspects so that it's easily approachable for us as 21st century people. Um, and it was always, every, everything, every part of the visual storytelling in that series was helping to tell the story little by little. And every time you come back to it, I've seen that series uh, countless times, and every time you come back to it, you can see another piece of nuance and another piece of nuance, and it's, it's worth coming back to just for that. And they also do, the, they do with language, they add little things to how they pronounce English words and how they construct their sentences. Um, which really makes it interesting because you, you, you don't feel like these people necessarily are English just because they speak English. They, it feels like an entirely different thing. Um, it's also interesting because the way they tell, tell the story, which is the transference of, of Rome from a republic to an empire, uh, is not through looking at Caesar, who is the, sort of the main character of that dramatic moment, but two very compelling characters who are sort of further down the food chain. But we get then a more every man's perspective on something we usually see only in history books. Um, but yeah, so going back to that series over and over is sort of something that keeps on giving. So I would very much suggest going and having a look at it if you want sort of an introduction in how that's done very well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit then about um, character design uh, more specifically um, and how it often starts out with stereotypes and the problem being that we all have very, spe very uh, general ideas of what these things are without having specific understanding of where those terms come from. So it's a good idea to sort of be a little pedantic and go and, and kind of explore what the concept of a barbarian or a paladin or a ranger or a wizard, like these things that we all know through games, um, they can be worthwhile going back and sort of seeing where, where that word or that term comes from. So like barbarian, for example, is technically just a Greek slang for anyone who didn't speak Greek. And they figured, or they thought that all languages that weren't Greek sounded like bar, 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 bar. So they called them barbarians. Um, and just understanding where the stereotype comes from can help you um, understand how lim uh, limiting the, that stereotype is. And you can also then learn how to sort of bend and break that mold a little bit and still keep it applicable. Um, and when you've sort of figured out the core aspects of your character, you have to sort of figure out who they are as a person. A character isn't just, you know, a pretty drawing. It is, it needs to be a person. It needs to be someone with 
feelings and motivations and, and, and reasons for doing whatever you're going to have them do, you know. So when you do it um, for work, usually you're either provided with um, the stereotype um, or you are, just, uh, you, you, <laughs> you are given an actual description of something, uh, in which case you really need to go and look at everything um, to do um, with the build up of that character, but you should definitely never refer directly to other character designs. Um, an example of that is from the Hobbit movies, where they essentially have three versions of Aragorn from the Lord of the Rings movies, um, because they all look, sound, and feel the same. So it's, it's important to try and, and find, motiv uh, find inspiration for characters outside of sort of the realm of, 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 of the immediate um, feedback loop. So how do we read characters? We read them sort of in primary, secondary, and tertiary reads. So the first is silhouette, and it's entirely um, applicable to that. You can read pretty much everything important, or you should be able to read pretty much everything important from the silhouette of the character. So this is one of the, um, the daily sketches that I do. And I think it's a good example because you, you get pretty much everything about her from the silhouette. Um, she's huge, she's boisterous, she's got a giant spear. Um, her character is, um, I wanted to make someone who, um, who, who had like a very um, self-assured attitude um, <laughs> and also someone who was a little large. It was kind of fun to, to try and play with um, the perception of her being um, this really like cute, larger woman, but then she's a total badass, covered in scars, and very old school in her approach to uh, how she goes about hunting. So, for example, she she hunts boars with a spear. It tells you a lot about a person who is willing to face the charge of an angry wild pig with uh, with a spear rather than using a bow, for example. So, someone who likes to come up, and get up close and personal, and, and has no problem being physical with things. And then on secondary reads, you take all your uh, your general details and group them together to, so that you can have a hierarchy of reads later. And as you go into then um, uh, into building up details, you can then add tertiary reads, which is every little detail that you uh, you want to sort of pop out and, and tell little stories with. So you know, like her arms are covered with scars. She has um, like this really ornate. Um, sort of higher belt sort of thing going on. Um, and also I like the fact that, or I, li I like the idea of her having a sort of vindictive streak and making her entire cape just out of huge boar skins. Um, so this is a little bit of like my, my mental timeline for designing a character. Um, and the gen it's gonna come back to it later, but the general principle is always go from generals to specifics. So you want to start with your big shapes, like in, in, in the read. The primary read is the, uh, is the big shapes. It's, it's all, all the larger stuff. This also goes for when you um, think out the characters. Think about their major motivations first. Think about um, the larger aspects of what defines them. Um, and then I, uh, so, so I come up with that like, basic idea first, usually. Uh, then I try and give them a little bit of a narrative, a little bit of a reason for being whoever they are. Uh, and at the same time, I try and think about how to post them, like what kind of lens I want to use, what kind of um, perspective. And do I want them just standing around? Do I want um, like a really dynamic thing going on? It really depends on like, wh what story you're trying to tell about that individual at the time you're telling it. Um, then I get into uh, sort of the sketching phase and I start designing a little bit. It's all very mental at that point. Um, but essentially, by, by, by the drawing stage, I've done about 70% of the work um, far before I start adding any detail because all that stuff's up here and then I just have to sort of tell everyone else about it in some sort of visual language. Um, then I, w when it comes to coloring, uh, I'm not great with colors, so I try and sort of make that um, as simple as possible by breaking it down into ind individual steps uh, that I can unify later. Um, but it's a general rule of thumb that <coughs> whenever you come across a problem that is a little too big to take as a, uh, a large approach, you try and break it down into as many small individual problems as you can and solve them separately and then unify at the end. Um, and then you, know, you go into rendering and you add your little final touches. And throughout the whole process, it's always um, sort of a back and forth, back and forth between am I doing 
Am I, am I supporting the initial, initial idea? Is it all going into making a character that's worth um, looking at and, and, and thinking about and enjoying? So this is a little bit of that visual thing again where it always starts with like the big general shape. Um, and also like, for me that was the, the first part of this was the most important. As soon as I knew the angle of the, uh, of the head, uh, I pretty much had the rest of it in my head, so it was just sort of a, a way of carving it out of the canvas. Um, and again, like the, the entirety of the headdress was done in a very rough shapes and then going in and, and tightening up as you go along. And then at the end, I started adding a lot of little, little details and little designs to sort of be more compelling and see if I could make people be interested in um, learning more about the character. Uh, and then it's, it's also always a question when it comes to character design, of when to stop. When do you know that you're done with your character? And I, um, for me, it's usually when I can imagine them surprising me about something, um, sitting and having a conversation with them and imagining that they would say things that are not in my head. Like that when they are a separate person mentally, that's usually when I feel like that's a, that's a fully fledged character at this point. So, I mean, that's going to be different for everyone, but I think in general it's, it's a good place to, to be um, if you can imagine them sort of going and moving around and having, having their own life, essentially. And so, a few notes on studying. Um, studying hard is good, but uh, studying smart is far better. It's important to, um, uh, as, as with um, the approach, to uh, character design, it's important to, when studying, be very mindful of what you're trying to get out of the study and focus on that one problem to solve. Um, a study should be um, sort of a mental game where you, you ask yourself some questions in the beginning and then you try and find very um, applicable ways of solving that so you can apply it to, to, to later artworks. Um, and this also goes into building a mental library to be able to draw stuff from your head and draw without reference. Um, usually when it comes to sort of the question of reference, which comes up a lot, I am not a big fan of, or actually I'm, I'm a big fan of reference, but you should find reference and you should study it and figure it out and then log that stuff away in your head so that you can call on it later and, and use it actively. Um, and it's, it goes back to what Sean Sylvester was talking about, um, of understanding. You study to understand, you study to be curious, and when you've satiated your curiosity, you can go on and, and actually use your understanding to explain it to other people. Um, so yeah, study to understand, not to copy. And also, um, another sort of aspect of studying is to make up your own rules for things, uh, like for color design or for, for this or that or the other. And every rule you've ever heard anyone give you ever is there so that you can break it. Just try and break it in interesting ways and then you'll have made something new. Um, and then of course it comes to the, the terms of inspiration. Um, I don't like inspiration because it's really fickle and you can't rely on it. Like it comes around from time to time and it's really great, but it's, um, it's never there when you need it. So having discipline is, is, is usually a, a better way of going about it, being aware that some of it's going to be not super fun, but it's, you, you gotta do it anyway. But also finding other, other things to be inspired by. So reading and writing are big for me. Uh, I've been doing that a lot with, with the character design exercise that I do. Um, working out is very, very good. It'll, um, it'll help you out of, of, of thought ruts and stuff like that. And just getting out in nature. So, you know, take your time and sharpen your axe and keep on drawing. And this was a very short talk, short, short talk but that's because I'm going to do a demo as well. So that's the end of the rambling and now I'll get drawn. <laughs> So I figured I would do like, um, I would solve two problems with one piece. I'll, I'll do my daily drawing now. And make you all watch. So if anyone have any, have any requests or questions or whatever, uh, either shout out or, you know, don't, whichever.
So I figured, since I talked a little bit about them, I would do like a portrait of a dwarf, because I'm a big fan. So if you have any, have any suggestions, for example, things you'd like to add to this guy, shout it out. So as we talked about, it's all about like large shapes now, trying to build something that's kind of interesting to look at. Right now, I was thinking about um, someone old and really like scarred and, and, and kind of fucked up because it's more fun to, to draw them. So I, uh, I figure out, like, I'll, I'll, I'll plan out the, the general aspects of them first and then sort of figure out, um, you know, you can tell a lot. It's, it's going to be one of those things where you can tell a story through an aspect of the design. So I figured I would design him sort of wounded in a specific way and then that could tell the story of um, of who he is and, and how he became this person who's worth watching. Oh, actually, yeah, that was something we did uh, in Croatia. Anyone who, who wants to can take their sketchbook out and draw one as well, and then we can have a look at them afterwards. Do it. Draw me some dwarves, people. So I'm being really like loose and sketchy about it. I'm not going into any details quite yet, but that is actually going on like up in my head. So at this point, like <laughs> I could I could call it a day because I know what I want to do. But you know, you can always discover more things.
so just referring back to the talk, like at this point, I'm, I am thinking about um, sort of the greater um, world that's around this guy, and um, like what stuff is available to him? Why, why would he look the way he does? What's um, essentially ev every choice you make, you can you can go pretty deep into the into the wormhole of like asking continuous questions, um, and essentially the. The sky is the limit when it comes to that, but um, yeah, like for example, with 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 his beard, how do how would I uh, go about making it more than just you know a big fluffy thing? How maybe he braids it? Maybe he uses sort of ornaments and stuff like that. So a lot of the times they'll go in and do like a really tight line drawing, but um, taking a, a page out of um, some of the stuff I heard earlier and trying to like change up the process a little bit. So I'm going to forego the line drawing and try and sort of add detail um, more painterly this time maybe. Could be fun. No questions at all? Say what? Well, then, if I do the brushes myself? Um, almost never. I steal a lot from a lot of people. Um, anywhere? There's tons of them for free on the internet. DeviantArt, a lot of bigger artists have, um, have their published on DeviantArt or uh, you, you, found, you find random links here or there. Like, I don't know. I have I have a couple of gigabytes of brushes hidden away on my my uh, hard drive. But I do manipulate brushes quite a bit. So like if I find 
a specific task that I need to brush for, I'll go and find something that does that, that has mark making capabilities that I like, and then I'll sort of screw around with it in Photoshop and, until I find something that I need or find useful. It's, it's, it's probably something, the question was whether or not I like drawing dwarves so much because I can't grow a beard. Um, yeah, that's not entirely untrue. That's probably some sort of making up for lost time. What a cruel question. When I try to, what do I draw when I try to leave my comfort zone? Um, elves. <laughs> well, elves are not that difficult. Um, now, I, I, if I if I try to sort of challenge myself, I'll I'll go and do like some something science fictiony or something. Um, it's hard to say. Like at this point, I'm I'm fairly comfortable with being uncomfortable with things. Like I'm pretty well aware of of the vast uh, array of things that I can't do.
Yeah. <laughs> Hmm? Yeah, what's his, what's his, what's his, what's his yeah, I figured I'd just do like this entire side as a huge scar. And it's either like torn out by a bear or something. Maybe a dragon. That can be cool. Huh? It's true. I've done a bear. Ah, let's do it. Let's do it. He's, been, he's had his half of his face ripped out by a dragon. That works. This is one of those interesting, th I've, I've never actually seen a face sort of half ripped out by a giant talon, so you kind of have to think about how that might look. You can make some cool designs out of it though. Oh, maybe it went far. It cut his mustache. Seems to be approaching in kind of designing flat colors. Do you think about the lighting secondary? Yeah, um, I'll just repeat the question so they can hear it. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, as I said, with um, yeah, the question was, I, I design in flat colors and then sort of add light and shadow later. Uh, usually, I'd, I'll do this in line, but it takes a while to do. It's not a very time efficient way of doing it, so I, I wouldn't have time to do that now. Um, but yeah, I, I usually try and design in, in as simple a way as I can and then sort of add complexity through layers. Um, and it goes back to that thing of trying to break down every visual problem into its core or its, its basic segments and then solving them individually. Because um, I don't have the, I don't know, the fortitude to do it all together. Some people can, but I'm not one of those magicians. So right now I'm trying to arrange this abstract stuff going on in the background to sort of lead the eye into him a little more. 
it's not a huge thing, but it does help to add like a path for the eye to uh, lead it where you want it to go. I'm going to start adding some shadows. Um, I usually use um, a multiply layer and depending on what quality I want for the light, I'll usually um, adjust the shadow to match. So I'm going to have uh, some pretty uh, sort of flat light coming from above. So I'm going to generally go in with a desaturated but warm shadow and sort of carve out the shapes a little. And again, it's very much general to specific, so it starts with large brush strokes. Whether I flip my canvas, yeah, I have it hotkeyed to uh, to F2, and I usually do it like later on in the process to start sort of quality checking it. Uh, but yes, <laughs> depending on how large the piece is and how complex it gets, um, sometimes I'll, I'll do like three, four brush strokes and then flip and three, four more, so that you make sure like if you if you're working on the finer balance of things, sometimes you can find that like the smallest shift in detail can have fucked up your piece irreparably, and so you, I get really. Um, <laughs> trigger happy with the, the flip button. Good question. Um, the question was whether or not I, I always stick to this or like try other things, like painting directly. Um, some, I mean, I, I sometimes go in and just paint um, without any layers. Sometimes just go in like one single layer and just keeping to it for the challenge of it. 
but um, yeah, usually I, I, I approach it either this way or at least with this mindset. Like I don't always use the same layering process. Sometimes I'll, I'll try something out. Like it, it's part of um, what's fun about like having this daily sketch thing is that there are no other goals than what I want to do. So uh, yeah, like s the process usually involves uh, doing like tightened line drawings and I'm sort of forgoing that today. So there, there, there is change up, but it, it usually um, flows from the same sort of mental build up towards a picture. get a lot out of using a, like a large brush and the lasso tool so you can control the edges while still getting sort of the freedom of large brush strokes so it's worth playing around with Uh, you hide the selection by just pressing Control and H. I think that's true for pretty much. Yeah, you can do that, but with, with, with quite a few functions in Photoshop, but you can you can hide the the visual aid of it by con pressing Control H. So this is one of those examples of I probably should have flipped before because I now see that the, the silhouette is a little wonky. So I'm, I've grouped up all the layers that make up um, what I want to correct for. Uh, yeah. And then I can add a mask to it and carve away. If I end up regretting that, I can always go back and, and Add it back in again. Uh, this button right there. Yeah, boy. Oh, yeah, okay. That might be a good idea. Um, yeah, no, I've, I've been sort of sitting here, here in, uh, and thinking about the fight he must have had with, with whatever beast carved out how, half of his face. And uh, so I'm going off of the stereotype of like the old grizzled veteran sort of person. Um, I considered putting a, uh, like, a, like a pipe in his mouth, but it was a little, it became a little too much. Um, Mostly I'm trying to sort of figure out little um, little details that I can add in that can sort of tell um, parts of his character that would be sort of counter to the stereotype, sort of like breaking that mold a little bit. 
Um, huh? I, I tried giving him silly hair, because I, <laughs> I find that like, there, there, there's something to be said about non-cool things. They can add like a really nice little dimension, because a lot of the stuff that we, we consider cool and well-designed do sort of um, all answer to, to a hierarchy of, of choices that aren't universal. They've, they're, they're pretty modern in an affectation. So adding stuff that looks kind of silly um, out of context can be pretty badass if it's sort of um, tagged onto a person who, uh, whose personality sort of, um, is more dominant than their appearance. So if like a grizzled veteran with like a plumed helmet, a plumed helmet looks silly as hell, but if it's on someone or being used by someone who is um, by their very being, uh, like dramatic and, and, and impressive, then it becomes something different. Yeah, just repeat what he said, like so adding something silly to someone serious, that does sort of accentuate the fact that they can, by the power of their personality, manipulate our uh, way of seeing them that makes them cooler because they run up against something that seems counter to the stereotype we base them on. <laughs> so it's not badassery, it's cowardice. I'm also trying to stick as much as I can to like the the big soft brushes, just so I don't get tempted into like starting to noodle on the details, because that is <laughs> that is my natural sort of thing to do. I think it comes from coming from drawing rather than painting, so I'm always like always looking for excuses to go in and render. So for, for his adornments, I kind of, I'm thinking sort of um, like really heavy old gold sort of things. Um, maybe with some, um, some engraving on them. Um, and seeing as this is going to be a fairly quick sketch, it's going to be solved through like visual uh, noise rather than like actually going in and, and noodling out those details. You can get a lot for free by um, I'm sort of trying to trick trick the eye and let the let the viewer, uh, the audience, supply the detail themselves by hinting at detail rather than sort of going and fletching it out. You see, like gradually, as as the the shape starts um, 
sort of appear out of it, the, the brush gets smaller and smaller because now that the big brush strokes have, or the big strokes have been put down, then you can start getting more and more specifics. So following that principle of generals to specifics. Give him, give him some gray in that beard just to make him a little more gentlemanly. Okay, so now we have something. Let's try and add in some light. So, again, seeing as I'm going to go with um, a fairly sort of cool um, light, I'm going to use linear dodge and then use like a really deep, somewhat saturated, uh, but dark color. And linear light essentially does the layering for me, so it saves me some time and some headaches. Now it's, it's really attempting to sort of, um, to, to, to apply the light equally all over the place. But again, we can design the lighting a little bit so that we can pull the eye up towards that one big narrative piece, which is the big ass scar. Mm. Oh, I just got an idea. What if when they sutured up his face, they did so with gold. They used, well, you know, like you can, what do they call When they used like metal things to close wounds? Staples. staples. Essentially golden staples. That look good. Um, I usually look for reference pretty much anywhere, so I drew, I have drawn quite a few scars, um, and you do go and find some <laughs> pretty horrendous references uh, and, and study them, so it is a weird feeling to find yourself sitting at your studio at like nine at night looking at, looking up <laughs> pictures of scars so that you can have something to study in the morning. That's when you know you're doing it right.
trying my best not to get all stuck in in, uh, in the noodly details, but it's so tempting. Huh? <laughs> Hmm? No, that's it's an it's Norwegian time or Danish time, so I think it's it's an hour wrong. Uh, yeah, I, at my studio or yeah, at the studio space in Copenhagen, I have a Cintiq, uh, and then whenever I'm out traveling, I use uh, the Cintuus. But I <laughs> I've been looking at the the new iPad Pro thing. It looks Looks very tempting, so I might might try me one of those. Because while while the interest is good for for painting, it is not great for doing a lot of, uh, of line work. Uh, you end up being very 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 dependent on the Control Alt Set key.
Still no questions at all? That's, I wish yes. I... Uh, usually, uh, usually I start in color. Uh, if I if I go for grayscale, I usually just stay with grayscale and try and do as much as I can with values and try to make that interesting on its own. Um, splashing color on that's sort of that's the last minute thing, um, unless it's like a graphic um, approach, just adding like a blue hue or something like that. I usually try and uh, and work directly in color as best as I can. I'll just repeat the question, but yeah, um, I think implying detail. Uh, the question was, or was it was more of an assertion, really, that I it, I was still zoomed out, even though I'm sort of implying a lot of detail. Uh, I haven't really like, rendered out much of it yet, um, and I think that's. Um, I mean that that is by choice. That is so that I don't um, start sort of noodling intensely at like one specific thing and sort of lose track of everything else. I tried to work. Um, at sort of this um, magnification as much as I can, just so I can keep sort of an eye on the entire piece at, the, at any given time. Um, at the end, I'll probably go in and sort of add, add a few um, specifically uh, polished places, or polished to specific places. Um, but yeah, no, usually I try and work pretty zoomed out.
How long does it usually take you to do all these? Uh, how long does the daily sketches usually take? Uh, usually between, it's usually between one and three hours, depending on how much time I have on that specific day. Um, then sometimes I'll find myself being at the office at like two in the morning, going on you know, the fifth or sixth hour, because you're like, oh, this one's fun. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of erratic. Um, timing is not something I do very well. It depends on how well it's going, how much I'm learning from it, if I'm finding something new, if I'm just enjoying some comfort zone doodling. Um, yeah, I try to keep it around three hours at, at the max. Uh, well, that, that, that's one of those things that makes it kind of erratic. Like some of them are, are larger compositions with multiple figures, and so they naturally take longer. And then something like this, uh, I can usually push out uh, quite a bit quicker. Um, but then, you know, you, you run the risk of suddenly being stuck in, in your own comfort zone. So then I'll, I'll usually try and find some other way of making it challenging. Like um, the way I, I started discovering how efficient it was to use the um, the soft brush to sort of mold out shapes and. Um, and and you, you, get, you get a lot for free by using either textured brushes or, um, or soft brushes uh, in, in as much as you can lose a lot of uh, edges and, and you, don't, you, can, you can sort of choose which ones you want to tighten up afterwards. It's easier to go with that way than the other way. Um, and I found that through just trying it out, but I, that was one of those six hour ones because suddenly I was like, ah, oh, shit, I've spent too long. But thank you for the question.
That's a, that. So the question was, how did I develop my ability to control values? Yeah, how you Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think I did anything sort of... I mean, I've studied a lot of different photography um, and sort of like done, done studies of that, specifically value studies. So while I didn't do anything specifically directly, I, I, my approach to values is fairly sort of simple. Um, use contrast to, to attract the eye to where you want to go and then if you want to you know, work specifically in low contrast you can achieve certain moods or if you want to work in high contrast you can achieve certain effects from that. Um, don't really use any sort of overarching um, specific techniques, techniques for it. Um, I just, it's another tool. Uh, I try and just approach it as um, what can I um, apply in terms of value to, to achieve whatever effect I want for this character. So this guy is, you know, big, not big, he's a dwarf, but, <laughs> but he's imposing and sort of impressive, so I want to sort of light him um, sort of from a little bit of top down. I could, have, I was considering doing like an underlighting, but he's not supposed to be like scary because of the situation. He's supposed to be imposing because of who he is. So I just wanted like a clear, pretty succinct light, lighting for him. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> If you're curious about anything, please ask questions because it does make my life a lot simpler. I don't feel like I'm just sitting here. Oh yeah, um, I'll just repeat the question again. Uh, the question was whether or not I do a lot of like color correction and color grading. Um, and uh, yeah, I usually for, for the last sort of 15 minutes of any piece, I'll. I'll I'll go through some, some filters and just play around to see if I get like an effect that accentuates what I want it to do. But I usually don't do anything um, super dramatic with it. It depends on, on uh, whether or not it's personal or client work. Some clients have very sort of specific uh, benchmarks they want to hit and you can achieve that extremely simply by some, some clever filter use. 
So you can save yourself some time and some, some, some headaches with that. Yeah, oh, yeah, I should have probably touched on that too. Um, yeah, what I've been doing with the daily drawings is to sort of write a little bit of story um, next to it and sort of trying to imply, you know, bigger happenings and a, and a bigger narrative in general, apart from what you see in the picture. Uh, and so I've been <laughs> essentially doing that while we've been sitting here, um, sort of figuring out what is essentially happening with this guy, or is this just sort of a, a presentation of him? Uh, I think it is the latter. Uh, just for, for what I would write for this one, for example, would be explaining what happened to his eye and um, trying to sort of uh, write his... Um, it's really hard to explain because it's not something I've really sort of quantified, but it, I think it's about trying to explain with words what um, can be a little obscure in, in terms of um, the drawn uh, or the, the visual explanation. So you can draw a lot of conclusions um, that might not be what I intended to say uh, by just looking at the image. So it's fun to sort of add a little bit extra on, um, on top. So the, the, um, there, is, there is a really chaotic process to it because it goes on the entire time. So sometimes I'll start with a pretty clear um, idea for a narrative in my head and then sort of make an image that complements that. Or uh, I'll have a very clear image in my head and then as I draw, I will sort of get ideas of, 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 uh, of who these people are. And then I want to sort of explain that little extra. Um, so it's essentially a way of just adding more information, stuff I didn't have time to do because you only have so many hours in a day. I hope, I hope that answered it. Um, I used to be able to watch movies while I worked, uh, but I can't do that anymore because, uh, yeah, it distracts me now. But uh, sometimes I'll, lis I'll listen to music, but I try. I have a hard time listening to music that has like lyrics in them because then I start like wanting to listen, and then that becomes a narrative, and then I'm like paying attention to the wrong narrative. But uh, I can usually listen to uh, to to sort of just lyricless music, instrumental, I guess is what you call it.
Hmm? Oh yeah, that's a good idea. It's a neat trick. Whoopsie. Thank you. <laughs> So, I think we're getting pretty close to done, so I'm going to go in and lose some edges. So I've taken uh, all the available information now. I, if you press Control A and then Control Shift C, you, can, you copy everything you have on the screen or on the document, and you can paste it on top and you get like a, a separate layer with all your information on it. Then I can go in with the smudge tool and lose some edges and get a little bit artsy. Yeah, I think um, I'll just repeat the question that um, whether any tips on like simplifying um, materials. I think the only tip I really have is to go and find the materials you want to simplify and, and study them in a way where you, you have an eye towards simplification and you're trying to get the first in, or the, the right initial read while being as simple as you can in your, your shape language. Um, I don't really have like any specific um, so the approaches to that, apart from, I think the closest I have to sort of a, a way of simplifying things is, is through gesture drawing, because you have to sacrifice detail for impression. So I think it just has to do with, with um, getting an eye for impressionism and then sort of applying that liberally. Okay, let's play around with some color correction.
go with curves instead. I think I'm just going to call it there. So thank you guys for sticking around. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here.